Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we're delighted that you have welcomed us into your home. We know that it's a privilege. Well, we want to hear from you, so send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have beautiful guests. Reverend Monsignor Vito Buonanno, who is the Director of Pilgrimages at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. He's a busy he man. He is, exactly what I was We thinking. also have with us today Father Ken Bobuena. He is the Director <laughs> of Pilgrimage and Visitor Services at St. John Paul II National Shrine. You can go to their great website, NASPASHRINES.ORG, N-A-S-P-A-S-H-R-I-A-N-E-S.ORG. So important, .org. go to the website because they will show you the 30 or more shrines that they have throughout the country. I've just been speaking with some of the folks because so many of them are here for a, a convention meeting, and each one is unique in their own way. One of them was just sharing from Michigan that they have the largest um, outdoor crucifix in the world. It's like, wow, I mean, in the world? And so that's one of the draws, yes. that, you know, that's to that place and various things to see. And they were also sharing joy that, uh, you know, it's not only that people come and they make these pilgrimages, we're going to hear more about pilgrimage and what it is, and they're so deeply touched. But those who are overseeing the shrines and who are hosting these people, they get touched yes. by the people who come and their, their devotion and their hopes and, and their fears. And, and uh, maybe sometimes they don't get the answers that, they're hoping for, but they get what they really need, you know. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about Family Celebration again, which will air Saturday, I think it's 9 a.m. Eastern yes. Time. Go to EW10.com. And thinking about what, what they were saying about people touching them. And we were touched by you all coming to us and when you write us an email. So just real quick, a couple of people who came to us, married couple, and this gentleman uh, married to this woman, he was a Baptist for 60 years, mm -hmm. 60 years and yet married to a, a Catholic. And he would, you know, go to mass with her and so on, but you know, never came into the faith. And one time she took him to Eucharistic Adoration for an hour. Well, they went to mass, mm -hmm. it was first Friday. They went to mass and then right after mass, they did adoration. They thought they were gonna go to work and then God showed up. So he was, you know, he was saying to them, yeah, we, we've gotta, we gotta go, go. To, we gotta go. And he's looking up at, at, in adoration at the Holy Eucharist and kind of looking, looking, and he converted. Like, I mean, 60 years a Baptist, mm -hmm. married to this Catholic woman. But I just wanted to share that, you know, that miraculous things like that can really happen, total change in his life and what it means for people. And you need to witness and testify to what the Lord's, I called him back again. I said, tell me that story tell, again. You said, say it again. And he was an elderly man yeah. and he was telling yeah. you the story, yeah. but it was his moment and time with Jesus. I mean, that was his point of conversion. So family celebration wasn't exactly a pilgrimage. NASPAShrines.org is about pilgrimages and is about shrines that can radically reorient and change your life. It's all about evangelization and renewal and going to this particular place and encountering Almighty God. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, today we have Monsignor Vito Buonanno, who is the director of the pilgrimages, the president of the National Association of Shrine and Pilgrimage Apostolate, and Ken Balbuena, who is the director of the pilgrimage and visitor services. So these guys go hand in hand, right, at the St. At St. John Paul II National Shrine go to their website. You're sitting home and you're thinking, I never know that it was all collected and it was all organized. NASPA Shrine, N-A-S-P-A-S-H-I-R-N-E-S dot -E H-R-I-N-E-S dot org. Okay. Yeah, NASPA Shrine. NASPA Shrines. We don't want them to miss it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but. We want them to Monsignor, go. Monsignor, you were with, with us last time. And yes. Ken, it's great to have you on board. Yeah, and this is your here. final show. So I know we that you really want to be grateful you for the opportunity. For it because uh, it's, it's a great work that you're doing, you're representing, you're having your convention 
our right. annual convention annual here. Annual convention that's here, and you're representing how many shrines, how many places? So here are about 20. Yeah. Not 20 mm -hmm. have okay. come here. Mm -hmm. 20, but there's about 30 overall. Oh, there are overall. about 30 in the organization. Not everybody can come um, because of time and money constraints probably, too. But about 20 are here this year. Mm -hmm. Ken, give us an overview again of NASPA from your perspective and what's, uh, what's so important about it? Why do people need to know about it? What can it do for them and, and for your shrines? Sure. Well, the shrines uh, uh, across the country, I and mean, we have over 30 of them in 17 different states, when they all come together at our annual convention, it's always nice to be able to see the shared learning that we have. So what works at Monsignor Shrine might also benefit you know, the work that's at somebody else's shrine, but it might not benefit somebody else, but what they do might benefit at our shrine. So right. the shared learning that we have yeah. is great because it's, it's a different situation for every single one. Yeah. Uh, and this particular uh, convention this year, we're having some workshops. So instead of just the shared peer learning, we're actually going to have a facilitated discussions. We're going to have some presentations yeah. Yeah. and uh, get to learn a little bit more on like the marketing side, for example. Right. Uh, what was very interesting, last year was my very first year attending the NASPA convention, and I was very impressed that some of the new leaders that are coming into the shrines come with a marketing background. I was speaking yeah. to them, I could tell. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, well, you know, the St. Rita Shrine, for example, I mean, they just hired a marketing director, I think, last year, and so over in Philadelphia. So she's been fantastic in trying to do a lot of things. Uh, it, it's interesting to see the, the marketing background that it comes from, because mm -hmm. pilgrimages are not necessarily something that is as familiar with Catholics in the United States. You go in, over in Europe, right. and you've got, like, you know, pilgrimages in Spain, pilgrimages in France. But in the United States, it's something that's not necessarily native to us per se. Uh, but yet the Catechism says in paragraph 2691, it says that pilgrimages evoke our earthly journey towards heaven. Mm. Such Say a that again. Pilgrimages evoke our earthly journey towards heaven. It was just heaven. what you were talking yeah. about, pilgriming. Mm -hmm. pilgriming. Yeah, we were talking about the Psalms of Ascent mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I don't got the listing of them all. But uh, yeah, these are Psalms that the Jews would sing or mm -hmm. recite as they were ascending, going to Jerusalem. Because the tradition mm -hmm. of pilgrimage mm -hmm. goes back centuries mm -hmm. to exactly. our Jewish roots. Right. I mean, the Blessed Mother, St. Joseph, mm -hmm. Jesus, the apostles, mm -hmm. they went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem mm -hmm. several times. And a lot of times we realize the great sacrifices that are involved in it. And sometimes maybe people will not be so reticent to go there. They may maybe think about that. You know, why do I have to go there? Why wouldn't I go to Disney World? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I go to a museum? Well, many times, although people will come into our shrines and they'll look and they'll say, isn't this a beautiful place? Many times I've had to tell people when I've heard them say, isn't this a beautiful museum? Mm. Well, it, it may have beautiful liturgical art yeah. and stained glass, but it's a place of worship. Mm -hmm. right. And one of the things I do think that is interesting about people and learning about, yeah. even in our own individual shrines, to learn about the history of our shrine. I didn't know until I started to work there that the very first pilgrims to the shrine, when, before it was a basilica, uh, in DC were from my own home diocese of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. They were there shortly after the cornerstone was laid in 1921 and who sponsored them were the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. So here we are near one another right. sharing something. I from Brooklyn, first pilgrims to the Basilica National Shrine of the Immaculate Concession are from Brooklyn and can sponsor the, from the Knights of Columbus for his That's shrine. Fantastic. So how we work hand in hand and all of us being able to do, especially at these conventions, yeah. a lot of networking and being yeah. able to find out, yeah. like Ken was saying, mm -hmm. what are the processes and right. procedures that work right. for you? Sometimes they are different. Yeah. It is hard to compare one of the largest churches of the world to a small chapel or a shrine in the woods. Some people are in the inner city. We all have different, different avenues, different backgrounds, yeah. but the purpose of what, why they exist, we share all in common. It is to provide a space, a sacred space, for the encounter of the I divine. I know they all vary, mm -hmm. but what are some of the components that go into preparing you know, for these pilgrims to come? The relationship with them, what, what you're doing there, and then their preparation to come. What are some of the overarching well, components? Well, I think we all usually work with diocesan coordinators that are in dioceses throughout the country, and we develop a relationship with them, and we're able to ask them, 
what are the pilgrims from their diocese interested in doing, what we could provide for them, yeah. and how they may want to work it and change it. They may want to do the rosary in different languages. They may want to sing it. They may want to have presentations throughout the shrine in different chapels during the day that are specific addressing needs of that diocese, of that group of people. Uh, all of them, yes, they address different individual needs, but ultimately through the sacramental graces of s reconciliation and Eucharist, yeah. which is really the purpose of a shrine, uh, mm -hmm. many people come and experience what um, they're looking for. Uh, many times it is for the grace of, of, um, of a conversion, right. the grace of a, a great favor to be asked. I know in our, in our shrine, we hear over 36,000 hours of confession and a Monsignor year. Monsignor does that all by himself? <laughs> no. Single-handedly. <laughs> right out the lines are out the door. Yeah. No, but we do all are involved in that. But to see that, especially on a pilgrimage day where we have mm. many locations where diocesan priests come and help to hear the confessions of their people, sometimes 25 stations during that day mm -hmm. uh, just to hear confessions. Yeah, spirituality is definitely a big thing with shrines. You know, for us, we were very fortunate this past August at the St. John Paul II National Shrine, which is just half a mile down the road from the Basilica. Uh, we hosted the World Youth Day Cross, so the mm -hmm. official symbols of World Youth Day, the cross and the icon. Uh, it travels all around the world. It's like the Olympic torch, if you will, <laughs> yes. of, you know, World Youth Day. And we had that at our shrine. Mm -hmm. And it was just beautiful because it was, you know, obviously instituted by St. John Paul II. And uh, we had it in our Luminous Mysteries Chapel, which features floor to ceiling mosaics that enliven the teachings of St. John Paul II, but also has a first class relic of his blood there. So, right. And it was, it was processed from your shrine mm -hmm. to, to our theirs. shrine, mm -hmm. exactly. where we mm -hmm. culminated in a uh, yeah. Eucharistic liturgy. When yeah. you say, is it a vial? of blood or is it blood shed that was on a garment or what you say you have we have his blood? so perpetually we have a vial of his blood that is built into the altar uh, of our luminous mysteries chapel okay. uh, but we also have another vial of blood that's uh, in a different type of um, reliquary but we also are very fortunate too on very rare occasions like his feast day on october 22nd we'll pull out uh, we have a piece of his cassock that he was wearing on may 13 1981 when he uh, was shot in vatican square St. Peter's Square. So we have a piece of that. Uh, we have a sister shrine that's over in Krakow, Poland. That's a St. John Paul II shrine uh, that has a connection with the Knights of Columbus as well because our shrine, St. John Paul II National Shrine in D.C., is owned and operated by the Knights of Columbus. Uh, we were very fortunate that um, while the main cassock is uh, in you know, the, the shrine in Poland, we have a little small piece of it at our shrine as well. Tell our family at home why a cathedral isn't always a shrine. Can people get married at a shrine? Can babies get baptized at a shrine? What differentiates and sets it apart? Well, a cathedral uh, comes from the cathedra, the word meaning chair, upon which the diocesan bishop would sit. And a cathedral is specifically built for that, has that purpose. The Cathedral of Washington, D.C. is St. Matthew's Cathedral. Okay. And uh, that is what differentiates it. We are not a cathedral, we're not a parish. We are a shrine church. Mm -hmm. uh, we guess, do not celebrate yeah. the sacraments. I guess that's one of the keys too. Yes. What's the difference between a parish and a shrine? Can a shrine be within a parish? Or, or, or are they just totally the separate or unique? You know. yeah. So there are, there are different types of shrines. So first of all, there's diocesan level shrines. So they get the uh, ecclesiastical approval of the local ordinary, the bishop, if you will. And so uh, you have those. And in some cases you might have a church or a parish that then becomes a shrine. And usually they have some particular devotion to a specific saint. saint. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the national shrines. So that is something that's designated by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, so USCCB. Uh, they have a document that they released in 1992 that goes over the norms of national shrines and it kind of details everything that's in there. So in order to become a national shrine, you must first be a diocesan shrine. So that's kind of the first step. Uh, so, as Monsignor was saying, I mean, we've got over 200 different shrines throughout mm -hmm. the country, 
but yet we have um, a very small number of that are part of the National Association of Shrines. And Total certain shrines were built just for the purpose of being a shrine, mm -hmm. Such like as ours was. Ours. Mm -hmm. it, both of ours were right. just for that, not to be a parish. Right. But many people may not understand because no. they may right. come and they may think that there's going to be things like First Holy Communion or RCIA or a wedding. Mm -hmm. Many people mm -hmm. want to know about weddings. Um, that's not the case. Yeah. And I think it's nice that way sometimes because you go to your regular parish every single Sunday and you get your spiritual needs there, but then when you come and make a specific pilgrimage to one of these shrines, it takes that spirituality on a little bit of a different level. You're out of the ordinary from what you're accustomed to every single Sunday, and you have this special place where you get to experience different unique artwork. Uh, and then sometimes the shrines have special events, like at our, you know, my shrine, the St. John Paul II National Shrine in D.C., we have um, domestic church days. So we try to take some of St. John Paul II's teachings and apply them to people's daily lives. And, and you, we host the National Right to Life, which yes. in January is our largest event, mm -hmm. sometimes almost 15,000 people at one mass right. in that one location. Our masses will go throughout the entire several days and it's a very big moment in our, our annual uh, events calendar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's opportunities that people will have. To know the history of a place thousands of people have come to, that's, you know, I understand what a parish can be, but to think of a place where hundreds of thousands yeah. mm -hmm. of people come to every year. Yeah. Yes. From my place, it is almost a million people come every year. Mm -hmm. What? among your group or maybe just overall even outside of I'm trying to think of what is the oldest shrine that's a part of your group that's been the shrine the longest and what's the newest um, I'm putting you on the spot here I guess but uh, do, you, do you know or have some idea about it? I would think that yours is one of the newest right? yeah we're one of the and newer we're ones almost a hundred years mm -hmm. in two right. more years now, we'll celebrate almost one hundred years. Our Lady years. of La Leche is in that a shrine? Yes. And St. Augustine. Are they part of your? They are. They, they are. Remember, okay. uh, they now that's so old. Now that's a site. Oh, yes, we had the first mass was celebrated in the New World. Right. And we're talking about going back to, it wasn't a shrine at the time. Right. But we're talking about its history. Right. So it brings, you know, Is it a shrine now? It. it is. Okay, so it's that's correct. what I, was, I say. I, I would say that would be the first shrine because it's so old. But you said, but it wasn't declared a shrine. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we're going to the different conventions and they, we try to rotate where the conventions are, what's really kind of oh, neat God. is we get to go yeah. to different churches. And last year we were at Our Lady of the Snows Shrine in, uh, in Belleville, Illinois, Illinois. And we ended up going into, I believe it was uh, in St. Louis, we went to a parish that was, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was around since like the 1600s. Wow. And it's mm -hmm. where some of the Native Americans first evangelized. And when St. John Paul II went there to St. Louis in 1995, I believe it was, they actually used the same chalice that was used in the 1600s wow, beautiful. Uh, for that very first parish. Well, Monsignor, we got about 30 seconds, a final word for our viewing audience and why they should look at NASPA and why should they be interested? Well, we would hope that you would look at our website to find out more detailed information. But we hope and pray that maybe this time with you and being able to reach an audience that we rarely would be able to have the opportunity to do so other than coming here, that the, the consciousness of being uh, on a pilgrimage would be heightened or the reason to be on a pilgrimage would be heightened. And to create that desire that um, to know how God calls us as all of us who are called on pilgrimage to journey to that heavenly city, mm. the new eternal Jerusalem. This is an opportunity for us to recognize and to provide for people the opportunity yeah, of great grace at these holy places through the sacraments, mm. through piety, through devotion, through communal prayer, private prayer, mm. all of this that's available for anyone who comes. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank, Thank you, Ken. Thank you, you. Thank Thank you for you. the great work Thank that you're you doing. Thank you so much. Thank Please you. go to naspashrines.org take a look at all the different shrines, consider a pilgrimage, because I really do believe if you go there, you'll encounter the living God and your life will be changed for the better. Please don't go away, plenty more to come. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. Well, we're going to get Father John's perspective on today's great show. But first, we're going to go to Rome to hear from Joan Lewis. Now, Joan, you have met today's guest, Monsignor Bonona, haven't you? And greetings once again from my home to all of you at home. And it, I have to say, it's very fun today to share some time with, among others, Monsignor Bonanno. Now, we've met a number of times at the Shrine in Washington, D.C., and one of those times was at a signing for my book, A Holy Year in Rome. This was a book I wrote about the Jubilee of Mercy and also about pilgrimages. And here's what I said about pilgrimages in that book. From Moses in the desert to modern times, man has sought an understanding of himself and of God through pilgrimages. A pilgrimage is not only a trip to a destination, but as St. Benedict said in his rules, it's a return to the promised land, to paradise lost, to a place where man can speak to God one-on-one. -on -one. By visiting shrines, I wrote, be it to seek spiritual benefit or to venerate a sacred object or simply to be in the presence of a holy person, pilgrims take an important step on that road to self-knowledge and on the path to eternity. Now, I've learned from many pilgrimages that I've undertaken myself, when they are prepared well spiritually, the, the heart of the shrine they visit becomes enshrined in, in our own hearts. Now, there may be an image of the Virgin Mary. It may be the remains of a saint. A shrine may be the site of a, of a, a miraculous event, such as Loretto, such as Fatima, such as Lourdes. But these always remain with us when we go on pilgrimage. We bring them home with us. Now, the history, the story of each shrine, of course, varies. Sometimes it's a question of, of a huge conversion. Other times it's a question of a miracle. Other times it's a question of a life spent in heroic sacrifice for love of God. But what is really interesting, think about it, when we go on a pilgrimage, we find a lot more time, we dedicate a lot more time to silence, to prayer, to reflection, to recollection. And that's something that we don't seem to do that very much in our ordinary everyday lives. So uh, when we do come back spiritually enriched, the best part is we often share that uh, enriching experience with other people. So what I have to say is if you need a spiritual pick-me-up, a tiramisu, well then why don't you try to make a mini pilgrimage, perhaps even in your own diocese. So time's up here. Back to you at home. Thank you so much, Joan. She does it all the time. So informative, mm -hmm. wonderfully presented. And I like what she said. She said, when you visit, well, you know, visit, when you go on pilgrimage to a shrine, you're a pilgrim, that, that something of that shrine is now enshrined mm -hmm. in you. That, that charism that's there, why you're visiting, that kind of gets enshrined, imprinted on you. Yeah, I think I would say that each shrine has a unique characteristic about it, a unique charism. Mm -hmm. okay. If you look at all the shrines on the NASPA website, each one of those shrines has a particular charism uh, that has been given to that shrine. And that's why a shrine is a shrine. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. Really, a charism is a gift given not to an individual, but to, uh, not to an individual particularly, but for the good of the whole church. Wow, mm -hmm. that's good. For you know, right, yeah. and so... You can say that a shrine is also for the good of the whole church, not just right. the local community right. there, but, but for the good of the whole church. Um, and I, the last show we were talking about, um, I mentioned how uh, the shrine in D.C. and also the St. Jude Shrine had an influence on my own vocation. And then as a seminarian, when I became a friar and then went to seminary, my first year of seminary, I was given the privilege of working at the shrine. And it was right before Monsignor uh, Bonanno mm -hmm. was uh, uh, changed assignments. So I was mm -hmm. a different pilgrimage director there. And just having that experience there, giving tours of the shrine and getting to know um, the history of the shrine yeah. and all of the different uh, devotionals in the shrine. There's, mm -hmm. there's many different chapels to um, our Blessed Mother in different um, uh, backgrounds, different cultures. Um, I just was at the uh, blessing of the Trinity Dome, and that was kind of the crown jewel of the shrine. It hadn't been finished yet, mm. and it was the biggest dome right above uh, near the altar. Wow. And so right now it's just a beautiful shrine. I think the, 
the mosaic of our Blessed Mother, I believe, is 38 foot tall. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I think it's just amazing, mm -hmm. um, the size. And, um, but it just contributed so much to so my own So much to see, so walk. much to encounter. Father, give us a, a prayer and a blessing, please. Sure. <clears throat> Family, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he turn his face to you and be merciful to you. And may he show you his kindness and give you his peace. May Almighty God bless you this day, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be sure to tune in tomorrow, Saturday, to catch the family celebration right here on EWTN. It all begins 9 a.m. Eastern. Check the website, EWTN.com, for showtimes in your area. We're pilgrims. We're on a journey. We're ascending closer and closer to the Lord. Let's do it all together. Keep it on EWTN. God bless you and your loved ones. Bye now.